Welcome, everybody. Am I being amplified? You are. Yes. yes. All right. Um, uh, welcome uh, to the No Screens panel. We're competing with the Screens panel across the way in Boucher. Um, but here we are like, No Screens. We're them all up. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, this is the second to last panel of the day, um, that, or second to last conference session of the day. Uh, we will close with Adam Saltzman in the Fouché. So we're going to end and, and go over there and uh, end the day with, with Adam's uh, talk. So, all right. This is a massive panel. So what I have done is I've taken uh, the opportunity to give an incredibly stringent rules about presenting on this panel. And uh, we'll see where everyone can uh, get here. If they don't, they get um, shunned from the group. As I saw here, here for Iron Game Design Challenge, there was a lot of shunning facts in the group. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm not going to talk too much, but what I've done is um, put together a presentation of everyone's work. Everyone's going to only show between one and three images. That's it, and then we'll go to blank screen. We'll actually have a conversation, which is going to be amazing. Um, and there are a couple questions I've prepared for the group, and then we'll just open it up to the peanut gallery. All right. Um, rather than introduce everyone, uh, we're just going to go in order, and you'll introduce yourselves. So uh, what do you say we get started with my cue? Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, Right now I'm working on my second GPS game, the first one was 10 years ago. It's only around in Japan, on the one that carried the GPS phone. The GPS at that time was really slow, and the app site was very slow, and since then I've been waiting for uh, something that could make things not itinerary, where you go and collect or find tools, but something which is action-based, and that's what uh, we're currently working, trying to make a multiplayer action-based uh, GPS game. So in this game, you try to zap incoming invaders, alone or with your friends. Each friend um, has different sets of weapons. Um, the idea is that, uh, to summarize in another way, it's very easy, but um, yeah, you start the game, start running outside, you earn gold by running, by killing monsters. Each monster has a different behavior. Um, most of them will use the streets to attack you, so that looking around you, you can infer where they will be a few minutes from now because the, they use the streets that you see, so that helps you anticipate their movement. You have access to uh, the usual mix of weapons, except this time, um, not only is the GPS your main controller, for example, when you drop the mine, you drop the mine where you are, but also we use the compass to help you fire in a direction, or you can allow a grenade using the gyroscope, uh, at the gyroscope's angle. Your long-term goal is to try to zap at least once each uh, type of invader, but the most fun you get is uh, collaboratively in the street that you organize to fend off the, uh, the invaders. Um, one last thing, uh, through the web, for people who don't really want to move uh, to go outside and play, uh, you access a, a map interface where you can play against running players. So you can take control of where and when the invaders, the invaders appear. It makes the system much more harder to beat for the players in the street. You can try the game. I'm uh, outside on the parking lot. We have a, a few devices that you can play around with. I'd be happy to, to play it with you. Uh, I don't know if that time remaining, but what you, the, the, what you see on the screen is the monsters and different players. I think they're set up uh, explicit. You have one weapon there where you have the gyroscope angle showing. Um, and you see the angle shown by your compass from the, from the player at the screen. Um, that's it. I've got a quick question um, before we move on to the next issue. We've got a couple minutes left. Um, so you're actually throwing, like doing this? No, I mean, the grenade, you do like this. Oh, okay. But like the, the shotgun, you, um, you have to turn around and, uh, and move. And, and we're trying to build around this as much as we can. For example, uh, we found that you can only uh, you know, kill, not kill a player, you want some other uh, dimension. We heard the player said, we would like to freeze it, but how do you freeze someone who can move in, the, in your game without controlling it? For example, we use the gyro so that you really don't count. Move, if you detect any movement, you will not be allowed to be back in the game. So we try to find as many ideas like that that can link the player to reality. Because that's an issue for us, and we'll talk about it later, that the screen is a frustration for us, obviously. We're looking forward to the day when each one of us has in his pocket you know, virtual reality glasses and you can shoot 
monsters in the street, but that's not there, so how do you cope with that? That's one of our main game design issues. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things is we're starting with Matthew because in some ways you still are sort of tethered to the screen despite Correct. the fact that you want to kind of leave it behind. Exactly. Um, and I think a lot of the, the actions, like the movements, uh, tend to kind of at least put the screen uh, subservient to something. All right, cool. Thank you. So next we have uh, Jeff Watson. Jeff, just briefly introduce yourself and then you can talk about it. Uh, I'm Jeff Watson, I'm a, a PhD student, I'm finishing my PhD at USC in the arts and practice. And, um, this is uh, the game that I'll talk about a bit today is kind of my doctoral project and it's also something that we're running um, for all the students at the USC School of Cinematic Arts. Um, it's something that was well, kind of a commission from the school itself, they wanted to find ways to bridge the boundaries between the often very distinct and siloed divisions of the cinema school. So you have writers, you have directors, you have animators, you have interactive media students. All these students uh, sort of historically haven't had a lot of cross-pollination um, and, and mixing between them. And, and also sort of side to that um, is the notion of, of just thinking about media transmedially. Um, you know, so, so rather than thinking just about your own discipline of, of art, artistic practice, uh, thinking holistically and thinking about how it might relate or integrate with other media forms. So uh, what, basically we're running a, a 15 week pervasive game. It's kind of designed to sort of run in perpetuity, but we're running this initial sort of you know, beta season as a, as a season, as, as a 15 week experience. Players all get these packets of cards um, you can actually pick up this, these card packs from me. We're going to do a demo of the game, like a super micro shop down version of it at four today over at the Big Games Hut. Um, so please come. Um, basically, the players get these cards. So we have these very physical, tangible objects. Our players are all coming to the same space uh, basically every day. A lot of them, the game is really targeted at the freshmen at, at the school. So a lot of them are actually living in proximity to each other, too, in, in dormitories. Um, so we have this sort of high-touch thing that's very non-screen based that's really about these tangible artifacts. And by combining the artifacts that you can see they've sort of connected the cards together into a sort of card matrix. Uh, but the basic way the game works is like you have these green cards which specify media artifacts that you're supposed to make. And then there are all these pink cards uh, which specify various properties that you, you should include into the project that you make. So a, a really simple example would be like make a slideshow uh, involving a hallucination. Um, so that, that would be a really simple one, but some cards have more connectivity than others, so uh, you could make a much more complicated and interesting deal where you have, like, make a slideshow about delusion involving a code, and you can imagine fitting on other things based on the connectivity schema of these cards. Um, so once players come up with this, it's kind of a procedural creative prompting system. Um, once players come up with a creative prompt that they want to do, um, they submit it through a website. So then we, we come back to the screen. We have this kind of very off-screen, kind of tangible card trading thing. People can share, collaborate, uh, you know, trade cards. Uh, but then when you're actually making your, your, uh, your media artifacts, you submit it through the website, um, and then there's a process where you have to come in and justify it and explain how uh, you know, in front of the video camera, explain how you incorporated all the cards that you incorporated into your deal. Um, and then it, it gets shared on this website. And you can see in the upper left corner there, we, we don't have Wi Fi here, so we can't really like, go to a live website. But in the upper left corner there is a, a tiny thumbnail shot of a completed deal. You can see that this, the, the players will integrate many, many different cards. And then they'll, they'll have the actual evidence uh, of their creativity, which will sometimes be a video, but we also have things like make a game. Make you know, character artifacts, uh, all sorts of different sort of, you know, uh, angles on media production. Um, and, uh, and then there'll be a justification where they'll explain how, how it all worked and then some comments shared by everybody else. So we, we really have like a hybrid game design here that, that leans heavily on the physical experience, but is really mediated through screens in terms of the, the, the output that the, the players do through the playing of the collaborative production. All right, next up, we've got Greg Trefry. I'll let you all dance for the slides. Cool. Um, so, uh, and uh, I uh, 
a company called Gigantic Mechanic, and we do a lot of uh, location based games or games in some way tied back to the real world. And, uh, so, you make a, game, a golf game using your iPhone where you turn it on and it drops a little golf course around your neighborhood. Um, we're working on another uh, game called Alpha City, which you can play over in the, uh, the Indicate Village, uh, which is sort of like Four Square Meets Bottle. Um, so, it's like a game that uses just a little bit of actual location data. Um, and then I also run the Come Out and Play Festival with Catherine Bergleck and Nick Fortuna and uh, Peter Lee and Timothy Romeo. Uh, so, um, and I teach a class called Big Games at, at NYU, which is you know about making sort of uh, street games and other real world experiences. So, I've seen a lot of sort of different uh, different types of games. So, I guess what I wanted to talk a little bit about was not so much any particular game that I've done, but like sort of the sort of problem uh, that I see happening, I've seen lots of these games over the years uh, of, of, of when you get to kind of get away from the screen and sort of when people start making work in this realm, right? So this is a game I worked on uh, called uh, Into the Wood, which was very non-screen, um, and it's a sort of a bulky game. Um, but I guess what I kind of want to mostly talk about was sort of there's this fantasy of what um, you're going to do with these things. So this is from a picture of uh, Can You See Me Now, the game by Blast Theory. It's all like this guy's running around and he's looking into his phone and you kind of have this fantasy that you're in an action movie and there's, uh, you know, they're catching there's helicopters and satellites after you and that sort of thing. Um, or probably you're kind of good at this, which is kind of sucky. Um, but also, you know, you need that information um, to sort of make the game work. Um, but then there's sort of the reality of uh, games like this, which is like you're hot and sweaty and blistered and like it's like that guy. Um, and he like won, but like it's kind of a question of how much fun he had doing that, um, or like you know can he go to work tomorrow? Uh, and so I think that, that there's a there's a sort of there's a lot of promise in, in making these in these sorts of games, but you kind of have to recognize the sort of reality of it, which is um, is actually user behavior. Uh, you know, so there's. You know, we all have this like, fantasy that we're gonna make people run all over the place and do all this sort of thing, and they're gonna explore the real world, but like people are actually really uh, lazy. Um, and I don't mean that like I'm really lazy. Uh, we make these games and then we have to go test them, and we're like, let's just test it here. Um, because like people don't deviate very far from their sort of uh, everyday patterns. Um, you know, you tend to be in the same place. And so these games are used to guess and this fantasy you're exploring the real world it is you know, sometimes a, a bit of a fallacy. And so one of the things we've really kind of have uh, come to, to, to think about at Gigantic Mechanic is like how you design um, sort of to the behavior players and then sell them sort of the fantasy of these sorts of games. Um, and which, uh, that they're going to run around and explore the world and that sort of thing. But then you actually have to design the fact that they're probably going to sort of have to, you know, and sort of, you see the same thing in which the that where it's like, oh, I'm going to be playing tennis in my house, and then, you know, after a while, you're just going to get a couch and like that. So that's, uh, that's something to explore with these games, and it's, it's certainly, um, in all the ones I've seen it come out play, the years of teaching, it's always a, a real tension. Nice. We're going to talk about that later, for sure. We have Natalie. Hi, Natalie, and I'm another game designer from Marketer. And the two games that I'm showing you are both a collaboration with Eric Zimmerman. Um, so what I'm going maybe to talk about is more about the, uh, more than about the game, maybe more about the space that it's around the game. And uh, one of the, the first of the two games was Cross My Heart to Go to Die, which was a come out and play last year that Brian is organizing, and it gave us uh, a great space, 20 feet tall. Uh, which we were so super excited and excited about. Um, and I think that every time that I work with Mary, we always think uh, that there's an event, a specific moment, and we always want, at least I want, that uh, the space that is made is both uh, amazing for who is working and running around, but also spectacular for who is not going to play that game. Or if there's a moment where nothing happens, because other people are being run, it's still an interesting play game central focus point that say something here is happening um, and will be a loud speaker for everything that's around. Uh, in general, and this is a good example, um, Eric always wants everything to be essential to the game and every component to be absolutely necessary. 
and personally after not to die, the wars were an essential part of the game. Uh, it was a labyrinth, the mechanism was that uh, there were three main group, uh, Ariane, um, the Minotaur, and um, Theseus. They were chasing each other, like in a triangle of love, you could be chased and you could chase at the same time. And of course, uh, the labyrinth was the Certain aspects were uh, we wanted to be as even and complicated as possible, but there were gaps so that people could see through and see what was happening in the game. Um, I think of all the games that we did, this is the one where the architecture component is the most essential to the game because every other game that we have done, you could uh, somehow also say, let's take away all of the other components that I worked on, and the game would work anyway. And that's maybe the next, next slide. Um, this is the game that we presented. It's, it's called um, Starry Heaven. It was an event organized by uh, our um, Kill Screen, the arcade event at MoMA. Uh, the biggest element are those huge balloons that are floating about the, the game. And except one uh, that's used in the game and that you replay tested was a one dollar balloon. Uh, you don't need any of that. Um, and I feel often that I need to justify why it was included in the design. Uh, and until now, Eric has been supportive uh, with uh, energy and, and, and budget, because I'm taking on the budget usually. Uh, but we, we, I think that we both agree now that Without that component, it would be a very different game. And that happened very clearly for one of the games which is not presented, uh, 16 Ton, where um, a very, um, uh, a game that could be also played on a tabletop, in fact, happened in a real scale, and you are surrounded by a wall uh, that's sort of hiding what you're doing. You're dealing with money, you're exchanging money, uh, and I felt that it was very important that you would do it in a kind of secret uh, environment and with your back being protected. Uh, we were dismantling the game and the moment that the war were done, when people stopped playing uh, when uh, it wasn't there anymore. But what basically I want to say is that I do feel that the um, physical component it does set a mood and tells you if something is happening. It's like uh, turning the light on during a dancing party. It's like decreasing totally the temperature if you are in a pool. It just doesn't work if certain components are not there. And I'm sure that when everybody else here is working in some physical uh, uh, space, it's much more challenging than it may be purely video. And, and then something that uh, is very different from other aspect of uh, game design is that we can now prototype it before it just happened and there's one shot to get it right and uh, it might totally uh, break the game, the situation that you wanted to create. A balloon malfunction. A balloon malfunction. <laughs> I've been checking the weather wind forecast for those balloon for a week <laughs> and uh, 14 miles northwest the day of the installation. Oh, yes. So. That's it. All right, last but not least we have Chris Weed. Um, and Chris, we're going to talk about a game that's... Yeah, so uh, I went to Goucher College, which is a small uh, liberal arts school. And, uh, so I had a good amount of free time that might be redundant, but, uh, but uh, in that free time, um, I like to sort of play games. Uh, but I, I, in high school, I set up a bunch of uh, capture the flag games, and I really liked, um, we played in my town, and I really liked how it sort of let us take over the town in a, in a way that wasn't like, too, uh, it, it didn't obstruct the town too much, but it, it sort of made us feel like we could take it over. But I wanted that, um, and I wanted that to be even stronger, so um, we went through a few iterations of games that we tried to play like, all the time, and they were terrible, but eventually we, we 
uh, came up with some uh, rules uh, for humans versus zombies. Um, and so uh, you should play that. Um, like we're running at the indicate uh, booth. But the rules are pretty simple. It's basically tag. And it, feel, it feels kind of weird to take like uh, ownership with like a tag variation, but I'm doing it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, it, it, we played it. It became big at our school. And now people are playing it all over the country. And that's like insane. But it's sort of weird because um, our our uh, like we, we run it at festivals, but a lot of what we do is still it's now on the screen, like answering emails and, and helping people run it. So it's like it's gone from like a real world project, and now we're now we're like helping people. And we we use software now uh, to help people run the game for free. So so it's it's uh, what what I think I like about humans versus zombies, or like what makes me interested, is like how it, it takes uh, an area, a location, and it, it transforms it. And when you're playing the game, you see it completely differently. Um, and it's, it's very uh, pervasive to like, the way you interact with the world. Um, so that's, yeah. Looks like these people actually have like, blood on them. People get dressed up. Yeah. <laughs>
part of um, that intensification or that desire to intensify space and use space in unexpected and weird ways that are typically used as sort of result of pushing back against some of the norms of using public space today, what's allowed and not allowed for sort of a political. Well, <laughs> I don't want to get it that far, but the, the, the point I was about to make is that to make it physical, a lot of people are acting with shared uh, experiences. When you try to move your arm, something happens that is beyond just the movement. And uh, I experience things more crazily when I'm running at the same time than when I'm uh, sitting and I'm cold blooded. And I think that's, I don't know how much you experience and like to support team sports at school, but your brain and there's another realm of excitement that's beyond just the pure fun of the, the physics engine that's running the game, um, or the rules themselves. So I think the acting, so at first I totally subscribe what you said, just the, the occasion of being foolish in the street is accelerating, and I think the flash mob is really something that uh, at least I feel we're after, trying to bring the occasion of flash mob. Our game aims at one day of anything 50 people uh, run. Um, but the third argument as to why I'm making this is that reality is so diverse. That's what you said about hiding. It's like we have an MMO which has been designed already. It feels that at least some of us should be trying to use that. Uh, so in the beginning, it was all about how we spoke. I mean, the first thing I was working, Pokemon you know, wants to be different in other places, but that's hard to do. But now we're trying to think of how like, monsters can really use the streets, and, and the game feels different. So when we arrive at the parking lot, we have this problem that they get channeled in the two main avenues. And around the office in France, it's totally different. They can corner into my place. So I feel like the level design is already done, and it's why I, why I like that, to use that diversity. Um, I guess for me, the reason I make up uh, these sorts of games is I guess it's sort of, I guess I mean, most game designers eventually have some, I don't know, uh, some mechanics they kind of fall back on, the things they like to do. I, I kind of love sports, so I like run around. So at this point, like that's just sort of the way I think of, you know, I, I think of game mechanics that are about physical things more than I think of game mechanics for video games usually. So it's like a, it's a pleasure to make them um, and that sort of thing. And for me, it used to be, it was very much about like sort of uh, sort of exploring space for a while. But like, lately, I feel like for me, a lot of that sort of um, uh, become if I've, you know started to be less, I guess, interested in that. But like, feeling like that magic, like that, you know. Like, you know, the magic circle is a lot more closed off than I think we sometimes think it is. And so it's interesting now what you're saying about like a, your work about like a, that it would be you know that you could take some of this out of the game. I, I don't know about that's true at all. Like I think that, that you know cross my heart open eye is awesome and beautiful because of like all the this stuff in it. You know like if you or if you took a single balloon away from a, from a, from a starry night, starry heavens, um, you would sort of lose the game. It would be like you know. Uh, taking art out of a lot of games, and, and I know sometimes I guess people turn down the graphics on games, and or it's just about the sort of mechanics of it. But I think as a holistic thing, that you, know, you have to have those parts to it in the experience. Because a lot of these games, you're very much sort of at, at war with reality, right? Like uh, it's very hard to compete with reality. It's pretty awesome and, and, and very high resolution. And, you know, on the screen is not quite as much so. Um, so, like, I, what I've, I've loved about the stuff you guys have done is you're starting to, like, like you said, like, amplify reality and actually make beautiful objects. Um, in the way that, like, even, like, a, a basketball court is a beautiful object. Uh, that's really interesting. I think thinking about amplification of reality rather than necessarily trying to, like, add something on top of it or apply it. I agree to many things that I said about uh, um, engaging socially uh, players. And the way that you've done it is a very physical and active way. And I think excited for the cross my art, which you were around the game that we have done, the one that we can so please. Uh, but I still think that the intent was the same to create our own um, social situation in which you will be play, in which you will be allowed to. Uh, be nasty, or in which you will um, just question your normal behavior in some way. So that was, um, even if there's nothing political in that way, uh, <laughs> the intent is there to put you in some discomfort. Yeah, to subvert normal social relations. Yes. 
and to reframe things in a way that, um, you know, like both on the level of uh, being able to kind of design a space and change the tone of things, uh, and then also to be able to frame social engagements in a way that uh, you know, creates, uh, in, in a way it does amplify. Um, I think that's one of the most interesting and powerful things. And there's a lot of stuff, you know, what we've seen with our games, I, I think all, especially students out of media making school, they want to kind of make media. And, and that desire is, is there, and sort of the practice of it is maybe a little bit latent because of the structure, the sort of traditional structure of the university. And so we, you know, what, what we were able to do with the game was um, was to kind of just bring out what was what was sort of already there and, and amplify it and, and create a, a channel for that desire to flow through. Um, Natalie, you want to add something? You get twenty five points before I break the deal. So, so the question for you, though, Jeff, about that is. Um, um, That's so weird. Yeah, that's really good. She's on the screen. Um, Somebody you can. Oh, really? Yeah. She got her own car. I mean, what, what, I, so I'm thinking about like utility, right? Like, like, like in a lot of ways, this game is sort of serving a utility at USC too. I mean, they're not getting graded on the projects that they're doing this, right? Necessarily, that's not part of it. No, the game's not mandatory at all, and we kept it a secret. Um, so we, we kind of framed the game to begin with that, you know, this kind of like cloak of mystery with things like uh, these flags that we have that we would leave around the campus that with no explanation and strange artifacts that we would leave around. Um, so, so yeah, it's really unofficial, but it is serving, it is an applied game. Um, you know, it, it, it does have a mandate behind it, which is really important to the, to the school and I think to the students as well, which is to, to kind of increase that collaboration and awareness and accelerate serendipity for them so that they're So yeah, the author is going to be interesting to mix that way. Yeah, I mean, it, it feels a lot to me like um, uh, Mary Flanagan and the values of play grow game cards. Totally, yeah. You're like it's growing media out of these and it really helps you do that. Yeah, if you kind of combine that game with, I don't know if anyone remembers Illuminati from the 80s, the Steve Jazz mm -hmm. game, you get this game. <laughs> awesome. Um, I have another question and I think um, you know, it's about what what we call indie games. Um, this is indie game. Uh, and are big games or street games or what are we might I'd be interested in the terms that each of you use to describe what it is. Because I don't feel like we have one term yet that's stuck as much maybe big games as for the most part. But um, are they the avant-garde of the indie game scene? Are they like at the forefront sort of Things ahead in a certain way, uh, or do you think there's sort of a throwback to simpler pre-digital uh, games and uh, things like the new games movement, uh, like to and, and others who sort of uh, we're, we're trying to create more sort of physical games, clearly pre-digital times. So what do you think? Are they like pushing indie games uh, ahead, sort of as avant-garde, or are they kind of throwback back to the to the olden days? Sure, and I don't know any publisher uh, working <laughs> in the field, so it's not a choice in, a, in itself. Uh, that's and so the, my answer to that is, uh, uh, it feels, uh, I feel crushed. I mean, if I would be working on any, any other field, I would be terrified at the talents of the other people working in there. And, uh, I, I guess every year passing, there's two titles currently that are making me nervous. We actually start leaving the field, but the Shadow Cities and there's a one of the game that's coming out from my robot. So the field is starting up, but um, the nice feeling you get uh, as a game designer is, well, you don't, uh, you're not being watched by giants at every step. Yeah. I mean, I guess I have a question about technical proficiency then. Follow up on that. And is it is part of why you're making these kinds of games based on the skill sets that you currently have? Uh, in my company, in the company? Yeah. Well, no, I mean, no, no, no nothing specific. I spent an amazing amount of time trying to put uh, animations about Google Map Kit on the iPhone. Uh-huh. They didn't make it easy. Yeah. They didn't make it easy for that, but apart from that, nothing specific. Um, I guess I'll uh, we'll have a judging by the number of people here, I go with Avant Garde. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sure. 
Uh, uh, just over at the screens talk. Um, uh, no, I mean, I think that, I think that's, I don't know. That's, I mean, it's weird because they, I think that these people are certainly doing interesting stuff and it's certainly sort of out of the, the mainstream. That again, I do totally think it is a throwback to like a older school, you know, to just, I mean, like, the, mo the way most people in this country interact with uh, games is through like the real world games like football and baseball and, and soccer. Um, so in that way, I don't think these are all that different. You know, I mean, there's sort of like different sort of instantiations of those sorts of games in a, in a way. Um, and I think people would say like football is on my card necessarily, but um, there's certainly not a lot of money in them. Uh, either, though, so. Well, there, there's money in football. There is money in football. <laughs> not even making football. Uh, there's money yeah. in running the league. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think there's definitely a. For certain aspects of like what gets under the big games umbrella, you know, I think I think some of the stuff that's a little more invested in in augmented reality and, and uh, mobile devices. I think there is a kind of a pretty clear like channel that that's going to I think move into a really kind of monetizable like big businessy kind of thing. So yeah, like, good, good job. But so, uh, yeah, I also come to yeah, but you know, I, I just think with like the ubiquity of smartphones and the increasing power of them, that it's it's kind of inevitable that these and, and the relationship between space and capital and like the fact that you, you know you can guide people to like through the gift shop, you can guide them to the point of purchase with the, with the game. Um, so that, uh, but I do think that some of the things that are more in that kind of throwback. Category as uh, sort of retro future category are uh, could kind of legitimately be called kind of avant garde because they, uh, in many cases, can be they're very difficult to monetize and even sometimes really difficult to document. You know, some of the best big game experiences I've had, and it's like it's hard for me to explain to other people what they've been like because, you know, I could show them a flicker set and, and that's about it. I mean, I mean, I uh, makes me think I, I can agree with you, right? So, in, in the sense of the drop on card, and that they like, have to teach you new behavior, right? I mean, like, so, you know, sports are going kind to of get that sort of thing. But, like, in some ways, I think, like, the most avant garde of one, like, one of these sorts of games is something like Warsaw, right? Where they have to, like, teach someone an entirely new behavior, right? This idea of, like, checking in where you go and, like, broad, you know, which was something, I mean, people, you know, that was just weird. That's, like, not something that people did before. Now they, like, kind of created this new behavior which other people are building on. So in that way, I think that's a really interesting, like, like you know, avant-garde sort of like, making a new mechanic in a way, which I think uh, you don't get very often. Now I'm sort of thinking back on that. Yeah, I mean, it's really, these games really are often, especially a more kind of ambient, pervasive background game like Foursquare, is they're really about the practice of your actual life. And, and uh, that's, that's where, that avant-garde, like, it's traditionally kind of operate on some sort of chain modifying that. Right. Everything else about Foursquare is not all our right. Right. except for that, like, a little bit of it, but we'll sell the game to add. Well, it's Foursquare or game? So, I, I can only speak for myself, but I think, I think it was sort of avant-garde for me in the sense of like pushing back against the establishment. Like it, it's funny you can have like football and stuff. Like I I play video games. That's how I grew up. Like I didn't play sports games unless I was forced to. And I think it, like realizing in hindsight really that I sort of felt a lacking in the team sport and like being on a team with people. And I think that's sort of almost why like you know we, we started playing humans versus zombies. Like that's why we wanted to play it. In, in the first place, but it's, it, it also really is a throwback because it's it's tag. I mean, you know how how long we've we been playing tag as like a, as a people forever. Um, yeah, but there's definitely it's definitely hard to make money, and I think um, that you know as much as that sucks, it's also uh, like I don't if there was like a lot of money to be made in in, in no screen games or, or big games, like I don't know if like the community would be as awesome. So I'm, I'm happy in that sense, but I <laughs> try to take solace in that. So super indie. Yeah, it's, it's, it's nice how how, uh, how close we all are. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> Even those of you in the last room. Um, 
Well, I guess I guess we're going to open it up to the uh, floor pretty soon. But I, I guess I have one more question and that is related to money. Like, how do you guys support this kind of work? Because I, I I've made games like this too, and it it, it it costs money. You know, it's not like it's free to do necessarily. Although I guess we can just do like a big game. Okay. But um, uh, how, how do you support it? Well, we feel pretty strongly that if we tried to charge people to play the game, it would just either not exist or people would play the game with the same rules with every name. Um, so, and, and we also just, we don't want to charge people to play because the whole reason we like it is it's just something you can do. Like, so we want to support that. Like the, if we started charging money for, to, for people to play, like it would ruin why we're doing it in the first place. That's like a huge problem. Like, how do we do that? Because we all have to work full-time jobs. Um, so we're, you know, our, our business model is like try everything else we can. You know, we're doing like licensing deals and uh, merchandise, and you know, and I think we might have to come up with like a card game or some kind of consumer product or go back to the screen if we actually want to support a big game. Like, I, I don't really have a good answer for that. But maybe you guys have have ideas for me. I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that for me, I want to make money for you. We know, uh, well, yeah. um, the, uh, but I think, I think there, I think people should charge for them. I think, uh, by not charge, I didn't come out and play in some way, we always be like, oh, everything will be free, it's a community only event, which is, I think, been great for sort of building community. It's also been a total, uh, bad thing because now people don't think they should pay for it to some degree. And so people do, you know, I think, uh, people haven't had a lot of success with charging for them. Like Simon Johnson and Simon Evans is from uh, from Big Fest and uh, Slingshot. They they run their big zombie hunt across the city two point eight hours later, and they charge an arm and a leg for it. They have to run it over three nights, and they get like six hundred players to do it. And it takes them three nights to break even on it. Um, but they like deliver an amazing experience, right? It's like a, it's like going to the theater. Um, and I think that's where a lot of these things will kind of shake out. Like they, you know. Um, I think that's sort of in not the theater makes a lot of money, so uh, not like necessarily emulating a great, you know, it's not a lot of riches there. But um, but like it, that's sort of to me like that's sort of the model that it looks like, right? Like you're delivering this great experience, um, you know, like something like uh, Cross My Heart Not to Die, which is you know this set piece, or like you know two minute hours later where they have like crafted all these incredibly interesting things and all a bunch of reality for you. Um, and I think that's that would be. Uh, an Model, but there's a real problem with it though, and that's scaling. You know, it's like it, it doesn't cost you anything to let another person to a rock concert, and it costs you a lot more to let someone into a game. And not every game should be for 600 people, so then how do you deal with that? I think that's a really hard, hard question. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a convergence with actual theater practice, right? You know, stuff like Punch Drunk, you know, yeah. where they're, they're really starting to actually make a lot of money doing what yeah. they're doing. And, and I, I think that the, the, those two kind of Directions from the sort of street game, big game people, and the theater people kind of coalescing on this sort of experience and event stuff, and it is kind of not super duper scalable. It's not, you know, there's I think that it, there's an important distinction between those sorts of event things that you can make profitable in the way that like a play is profitable, and you can really support it with a combination of ticket sales and grant money and whatever else you can string it together. And then there's the larger, like super scalable type things, which I think the, the, that uh, games based on mobile devices and stuff like that, where you're, where you're throwing it over a local map and it can be playable anywhere, I think that that's a, that's a totally different model. So I think there's that event model, and then there's probably some kind of subscription or like app sale type thing um, for, for mobile device driven games. I have little to say because my question is how we do not lose money. <laughs> um, so the best is when it's fully funded, uh, which has happened, uh, and also because we gave us maximum uh, money funded, but we are uh, we are uh, we invest in that. Uh, but we never even questioned it. Because the other thing that was and. Yeah, it's got me. 
Yeah, you want to make them because you want to make them, right? It's like you yeah. don't go into theater to get rich either, but like it's. It's like it's I want to have a gorgeous dress or high heel shoes, and I want to have a new one. And punch drunk, like that, that, that punch drunk show kills me in some way, right? Because like, and it's all about the expectation. People feel they should pay a hundred bucks for that thing, and it's boring. I mean, it's really pretty. Um, but I was, uh, I don't know if you know a bunch of you, I'm sure have seen it, but it's like, it, it was like a bad Bioshock level. Like, I was like, it could have been so much more. So, that, I know. so I think that if you train people the right way, they would pay for it. Yeah. Also, like, Hopefully there'll be more cross-pollination where we get some real game design. They right. keep going into those kinds of things. Yeah. Hmm. Well, we've got a little less than 15 minutes. I thought we should just like, lob it up, open it up to the floor here. Uh, we've got questions. Yeah, lots of people. So we'll go with. Uh, how do you see? Uh, to answer, how do you see these ideas you're developing in the digital space in the uh, experiment? How do you see that and those ideas filtering into the more conventional commercial spaces that are exploring the other time? Or do you see that? Uh, does that even matter? Did everybody hear the question? Yeah, how do you see uh, this work being done in the kind of more experimental space actually filtering out or up or into uh, the more conventional? When you say more conventional, you, you mentioned the other talk. Do you mean? I was just making fun. Oh, okay, yeah, because this guy's sort of like the establishment. Yeah, sure. Cool one. Um, <laughs> do you mean, yeah, it's my question is do you mean other kinds of big games or do you mean other kinds of digital experiences? I mean, I mean a more, into a more monetizable space. Into a more monetizable space, okay. Yeah. I mean, my, my experience, sorry, but like, uh, is you, you like, uh, so come out and play, like, I think there's always like great games that people come and they run around and they have a great time, and then, like, uh, and there's the commercial space, which is like the app model, essentially, and, um, and some people do a really nice job of leaving it in space, that's like a good job. Uh, but, and, but, like, like uh, a lot of them aren't that great of an experience yet. So, like, I, I, like what, what interests me is, like, how you really, like, make that, the sort of the visceral bud of running around getting that into an app is really hard. And, I mean, I think there's lessons being learned doing that, but uh, it hasn't certainly not solved the problem yet. In our case, uh, we're really trying to, trying, because we, we are in reality check all the time. We're making progress and we have a fun moment, but we think that if we reach the fun moment and we, we are able to make this kind of new type of sports or recess play, and we can uh, synthesize it in many different places and instances whenever we want, with, even if we're there, I don't think we're going to make money per se as it is, but I still think that if we reach that stage, there's a, a high level of chances and has happened in the past in my, in my job, that a brand would want to pick it up. And uh, I mean, it's not that far to imagine that you know, you pay millions to sponsor a sport. If you can make your own sport uh, with your brand on it, it, it there's, a, there's a way to monetize there and have uh, something to, to keep us going. That's, that's one way for us. Interesting. So some more questions. Uh, um, I'm wondering why there hasn't been more of a lead in the event space. I know I, I've been involved a lot with like these art warehouse parties in Brooklyn, and there's a huge appetite for like participation and role play and immersive environments. And people make their entire living off of running these events. So, is there a reason why games aren't happening more there? Have they happened in the past and it fell out of vogue? Like, you know, about that? So, the question is um, why haven't uh, uh, more of these kinds of games found their way into the event space? When you say event, do you mean like rave party? That's one very <laughs> Yeah, I guess they're not called that. But it's, uh, I mean, I mean, people keep referencing Sleep No More, and like Sleep No More is only the tip, like sort of most visible example of something that there's a huge appetite and market for. And you know, Sleep No More creates a very addicting experience that people will repeatedly pay after twenty five dollars to go to. Right. Um, that's that. I would just take a random guess and say that it's it's a bit of a kind of like social. Venn diagram thing where the circles aren't totally overlapping yet, but they're moving closer towards one another. Um, you know, I, I, I definitely, uh, I, I remember a friend of mine, his friend, he's like an events guy in New York, and, you know, I, I met for, 
my, my friend was like, you got to meet this guy. Like he's, he's always doing these massive events and, and you guys should talk. And, and uh, it was really striking how, you know, how, how deep into the event world he was and how kind of all of this stuff was really alien. And, and he was like, wow, that's so cool. I can't believe that's going on. And so I think it's like, I, I think events like this, you know, uh, events like Come Out and Play are, are starting to put it into everybody's view. And maybe that could be a part of why it hasn't totally... I, I, I think it's similar with what we were talking about with the theater, just actual theater scene overlapping with, with game design. I, I think that's really starting to happen. You really see that in the UK. Like there's, they're, they're really like almost the same scene now. But I think that, at, that hopefully that event scene will start mixing in and, and there'll be this, this kind of like center of the Venn diagram and it'll be all rich and chewy. Nice. Just as a personal experience, huh? um, I'm here because Eric is here at the very beginning. But I had no idea how interesting it could be the world around game design. I had my snobbish cloud about, okay, who cares? And realized how really like, brilliant and cultured and uh, lively, passionate, and everything you can think about are uh, the people working. I feel like you're pointing at me. <laughs> yes, you are. I mean, it's a bit <laughs> but I, so I'm just saying that um, when the um, uh, Surrey event was in one, I think the first event organized by MoMA, it was an event, it was an exhibition, but fully dedicated to games, so that's a good sign. I'm just saying, I know so many people that had my same attitude to game, which I'm not saying was negative, I love playing game, but about not knowing and not understanding that there was such a level of sophistication and uh, cultural avant-garde, yes, in digital game, or physical game, any kind of game. And I don't know how you can get through to all these other person, and I would love that to happen. Yeah. I saw some yeah, I mean, one small, other small thing to it. I think it, this is a uh, because I think there seems like uh, maybe we should not talk to the right people. That's it. Um, but uh, there's also the weird thing too. I think which is like with game designers, oftentimes you want to like make games to be an event organizer to some degree, and so like uh, oftentimes you make one of these games, and for you to sort of get a lot of uh, any sort of value out of it or really distribute, you have to just run it over and over and over again. Um, and which can be, you know, if you're really dedicated to that, that's great. But oftentimes we're like, okay, on to the next thing, and I, I ran it once, and 20 people played it, and awesome. Um, so like I totally admire like people like Greg Manley, like doing Circle Rules football. He just like goes and plays that every week in the park, you know. And he's had a lot of, you know, started to have a lot of success with that because you just gotta you gotta work that a lot more. You gotta be become like an event planner or something. Right. And then I would think that for those certain levels of game designers like you, okay, something happened, put it down, and you already have your thing. Like, it would make total sense to collaborate with people who just do events and only curate people putting things into the events. Right. You don't have to do any of that. I want to talk to those people. Yes. Sounds like the <laughs> chocolate that this peanut butter needs. Yeah, make that Venn diagram yes. that it should be Crazy. chewy. Yeah, for sure. Uh, hands, questions. Uh, one here and then we back. I think we're going to Oh, um, uh, for, first, and then uh, Susanna. Okay. Um, with these like <clears throat> these bigger uh, street games, how do you um, sort of like tell a story that is interactive in such a way where the events of the game become a part of that story, or and, and, and keep it fun at the same time? All right. So how, I don't know if you heard the question, but how do you um, leave story into the game? Right, and, and the events of the game, kind of how do they become part of the larger narrative and they keep that fun? Uh, I can try. <laughs> can sit and bang your tongue. <laughs> um, well, we're actually working on that right now. We're trying to have a more uh, sc uh, scripted scenarios for our game. And we pick uh, lo location points of uh, interest uh, around that. And then you, you just map your script and dialogues around those. Right? So, Take your typical left for dead uh, mission. Uh, we just look around if there's a church that we need, we need to re reach in our game and pick that church. And in, the be in between, can we use the shop that's there? And we're going to use that to anchor uh, our, our script for the for the story. Uh, that's that's one thing. Interesting. Cool. All right. Um, you, you yeah, yeah, um, so story in in HVZ at least. Um, 
it sort of came about as a solution to a problem, which was um, that one of the best strategies you could have in the game, which we, we didn't anticipate, was just to hide in your room and not play. <laughs> um, and so we came up with the idea of missions to sort of force people to get outside, but then, then we had the problem of, well, we can't really force people to play missions because it's not part of the rules, so how do we convince people to participate? And so we came up with stories. Um, and pretty much, like, we're not running a story for, for the festival, and pretty much every time we run, um, we run a game, it, it always comes down to, like, the gameplay always trumps the story, and we never really realize the story um, as much as we want to. But, uh, like, as far as how you do that, um, it's hard because it's, it's like, if, if you're running a game, you know, the gameplay has to be more important than the story, unless, you know, otherwise you're telling a story um, through the vehicle of a game. So, uh, I, I don't know how to say more to that, but... Well, I think it's interesting too, right? Because just like video games or all kinds of games, some are more narrative than others, right? Um, so I'd say Starry Heavens, you know, you can tell a story about playing that game, but the game itself doesn't necessarily have story elements built into it. Um, and in, in this case, you, you know, it's, gen it's generating stories. Um, and there's sort of, you know, I, I think there's there's an, another approach to narrative, which is, is not just sort of the branching narratives or, or, or embedded pieces of story, but kind of just framing and, and through the rule set, guaranteeing that a certain kind of story shape emerges. Um, and I think that's a really kind of tricky thing to do. And I think a lot of it depends on, on how you frame, you know, architecturally or, or spatially or just through the design, creating a tone that is itself kind of a narrative framework that everything sort of can fit into. I, th I think that's one one way that, that you don't get buried under the incredible demands of creating mountains and mountains of content for a um, like highly nonlinear story system that's going to run forever. And it's tough with street games because you've got to tell them the rules too. And they don't have that much time, so they're only going to remember a couple of rules. So you got to keep everything like short and snappy, yeah. iconic. Yeah. So I, I would say, uh, just to keep talking, because I think this is interesting, but I would say that the best stories are almost the ones we don't plan. They just sort of emerge, and players like create them for themselves. So I'd wonder, like, do, do, do stories come out of your games? Like, do you have those moments? And I'd like to hear about them, actually, if that's okay. That's my question. Most, when many people tell me that the, the most fun they have is when they walk back to, to the cafe, or they, as they walk back together after the game and, and tell each other what happened. During the game, they're spread out, they're high speed. But this time, when you just huddle and tell your story, it's, every time it's a, it's a good time. You know, I, I get it. Um, I'll go ahead. Um, I have two questions, and feel free to choose or answer both of them. Um, my first one is I, I kind of want to provoke a little bit something that was touched but discarded, and that's about sort of the fact that these, that these games could very well be argued to have precedents that were politically motivated. Certainly, the new games movement was politically motivated. It was a reaction to a pacifist reaction to the Vietnam War. Um, even even street protests and, and, and claiming back, reclaiming public space. And so, I was wondering if any of you do see your work as in any way, you know, politicized. And whether you do or don't, uh, are there are there potentials there? Are there limitations? Are there risks? And my second question is mainly about um, most people are not me. It seems to me that there's so much, just like there's a lot of interesting potential here between theater and, and these kinds of games, I think also with architecture and these kinds of games. And I'm wondering if the architecture practitioners, the discipline or the industry is, is paying attention and they're interested. It seems like there'd be so much, uh, you know, just interesting potential in the way we, we make structures, uh, make buildings, you know, live inside of them. Architecture politics. <laughs> Uh, maybe I, I want to answer the second question. Uh, <laughs> um, Sometimes when I'm, somebody is coming to me and telling me, oh, you're an architect, uh, and connecting games to architecture, they're thinking about the rendering and the spaces that in video games are designed and how they can be amazing. And I totally disagree with that. Um, to me, it is not very interesting, but there's something that Eric and I have learned that we are so similar, um, that architecture and game design are so, so similar. Um, 
which is uh, and that makes them different from other form of art uh, that are accepted. Um, painting, sculpture, uh, literature, movie. Uh, I feel that both architecture and game design, they need to have a working structure that you cannot break completely. Um, a painting can be a cat, a film can be, um, um, I don't know, totally inconsequential, but a building needs to stand up and again, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, it's broken. Uh, and this is when, there is, I think it's part of the argument, can, how can game be a form of art? Can they be functional game and still be a form of art? Uh, and my answer is yes, absolutely, they should be. But so both architecture and game design, they set some rules, some limit, and by creating those rules and limit, that's the way that they create a possible experience that we're not in full control of. Uh, movie and books, as much as you can have a white fantasy and interpret the book in your own personal way, it's a linear path that is um, fully guided. And I think that architecture and game design are the only two ones that work in a different way in that sense. You create possibility for an experience. And it's very defined, and your design will be very strong, good or bad, but then you do not control fully the experience of the person doing it. And I think that's really interesting. So I think that architects should be really interested too. Uh, as I said, I wish there were more um, possibility for game design to cross to other form of design. I remember we were in a festival in Berlin and they had a very good uh, game event, but they had also amazingly good concert and music. And I'm not saying this is just, oh, you need to attract with music, it's just be interested to something else and somebody else would be interested to you too, as an equal. Uh, and maybe that's a way to, that I, I can see that happening. I think the terror of launching a game is probably pretty similar to the terror of opening a bridge. Oh, yeah. You know, will it hold up? Right. Will it collapse? One might be a little more serious. Yeah, There's a little more at stake with the bridge. Yeah, yeah, the game. Okay. But it would be um, okay, maybe we have. I, no one took the political question. Do you want to take that? Very small thing. In my case, um, I hate cars. Um, and I like the fact that, apart from the social phenomenon of giving people the excuse to be ridiculous, which is too rare, I like the fact that the game, I've seen people are very respectful of cars and always watch crossing, will suddenly feel imbued with the right to just cross the street and force the sky, you know, like a bull, you stare at the driver in the eye. And the, I like that, that's my only small political <laughs> message. <laughs> the, the, the political question, I mean, it, it's, it's kind of confusing because it's I think it comes up a lot. I think when we started out coming out of play, it was a, it was a, I know some of the, we all, there was like five of us that were organizing and everyone had a slightly different agenda. It was a heavier on Nick's agenda, I think, in some sense, like this, like, this is public space and I should be able to reclaim it. And then you look at sort of the new games movement and some of these other things, or why people like make these games like, oh, I want to give people a license to act silly, or I'm going to even the playing field, like by making, I know like that was one of the things that Greg, Greg Manley was doing with certain rules, is like, I want to make a game that everyone's bad at. You know, so it sort of moves the playing field, um, and then uh, and then let people interact with it, um, it, which seems to be. It, I mean, it's interesting. I think in some ways, like what, how much of these games sort of like have the, a little bit of like kind of reaction against, like, oh, I didn't get, I didn't get to play sports, or I didn't, I didn't do that. And then um, the more people play them, the more aggro they get about them. I mean, so you like, I'm sure you, I don't know if you've seen this with humans versus zombies, but like people get, look like they get really serious about it, really crazy. I couldn't. You know, like, uh, and so I play like you know, if I go play Circle Rules now, it's like I, I can't compete with those guys either. And so you know, politics are such a weird thing to sort of put on the games because of, you know I think it's, they get they tend towards this weird hardcore behavior which becomes very much about that system, and you lose uh, that other sort of gentler or meaning that you kind of may have originally had the, the more people play it. But it's kind of, yeah, I mean that's that's one of been that's been a really interesting thing that's happened with our game is we've seen it's been running for about eight weeks now. And, you know, there was almost kind of like a you know the framing of the game and it was almost a, a kind of anarchist vibe that we were trying to introduce into the school and, and uh, you know um, to a certain extent kind of something that was tr try to turn some of the you know this school is training you for the industry type stuff on on its head and, and make it more of a 
DIY and independent. But what, what's really happened is, is there's been a lot of players that have taken very seriously and like formed groups. And you know, we've seen groups signing exclusivity contracts with, so that they won't work outside of their group. And we've seen uh, large pools that are almost like credit unions of cards forming. And, right. and, and it's it, in a way, no matter how much you design the system, it's always human beings that are going to be playing it. Um, right. And so you'll get these arrangements which echo right. some of the things that you might be being critical about in the first place. There's no control over people. <laughs> Man, I really have a big kind of control for that factor, that our games would be perfect. Um, I think that's all the time we have. We're about five minutes beyond time, but I want to really thank the panelists. You guys were amazing. <laughs>